Chicago. I'm very delighted to be hosting this conversation with Kathleen Osberger. Um, I learned a ton from this book. It is truly gripping, uh, deeply personal, and still attentive to the larger picture and social implications um, of this fascinating time in, um, in Chile. It's also a beautiful image of the gospel of men and women who lived out their Christian charity when the stakes were truly high. Um, and also just fair warning for those of you who have not read the book, you gotta give yourself like, you know, don't start it if you have something to do the next day, because once you get about 50 pages in, you will not be able to put it down. <laughs> so uh, fair warning there. Um, and thank you very much to Katie Arnold, who's hiding behind this book, um, for putting all this together, for the student helpers, Grace, Connor, Mary, for um, Dr. Mike Murphy and the Hank Center and their support and sponsorship of this event. Um, and also thank you to Father Dan Hartnett, who um, first uh, brought to our attention the possibility of bringing uh, Kathy out here to Loyola for this conversation. Um, so Father Dan Hartnett, he is a Jesuit who has worked in Peru, worked in Peru for about 20 years and since then has been um, in various roles, pastoral teaching and formation roles here at Loyola and um, in the Midwest, and he will be introducing uh, us today. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you. Um, Allow me to begin by thanking all of you for your presence here this afternoon. It's truly a privilege for me to present, um, to host, I think it's for Viola, to host Kathy Asperger. She's an amazing person. And uh, her book entitled I Surrender, put out by Orpus Press, is very important for its subject matter, for all that's happening in the world. And it's also beautifully written. She's really a good writer. Uh, so if you haven't yet secured a copy, please do. When we hear mention of 9-11 in the United States, our minds turn quite naturally to the fatal events that transpired here on September 11th in 2001. But to anyone living in Latin America, mention of 9-11 stirs up a very different set of memories. Memories of the military takeover, of a democratically elected government in Chile, memories of thousands upon thousands of citizens being brutally herded into a football stadium in Santiago where they were killed. I should me mention in this context that a large percentage of the people who were killed were university students. This terrible military takeover mark the beginning, unfortunately, of a series of right-wing military coups in Latin America, in Peru, in Bolivia, in Uruguay, in Argentina, in Guatemala, in El Salvador. Now, having said all of that, this book is not primarily about the bad news or the sad news of the right-wing military coup. I think it's the good news the hopeful news of a prophetic church. When I speak of a prophetic church, I'm not only referring to the hierarchy of the Chilean church, which did in fact take very courageous positions, creating the Vicaria de la Solidaridad, the human rights organization, which served as a model really for all the other Latin American countries during the 70s and the 80s. But the book also rightly highlights, highlights, I think, the daring actions of ordinary Christians, many of whom were religious women, who demonstrated enormous bravery by speaking out against the cruelty of a military, even when that dictatorship showed absolutely no indication of listening to them. I should mention that this military government stayed in power for 17 years. Some information about what transpired during all those years can be found in our information comments, for sure, or in other sources. But in my opinion, what makes Kathy's book so unique is that it's a first-hand report. 
is the story of a recent graduate from the University of Notre Dame who made a choice, a risky choice, just as she graduated from college, to go to Chile at that difficult time. And that choice put Kathy's life on the path of risk. It changed her life. I highlight this fact, particularly for any students here this afternoon who might be wondering about what to do after graduation. Sometimes the choices we make early in life put us on a path, a path that changes absolutely everything. And that certainly is the case with Kim. In her case, her choice made all the difference. When she returned to Chile, she became a community organizer, a form of social work that links you directly to the needs and problems of a community. And as an organizer, she learned to imagine and to create alternatives working alongside the community. And she's done that ever since. So I think we're really honored to have her presence here. So we welcome you, Kathy. Thank you so much. reaction might you have had upon seeing one or another of these photographs? Fear. Fear? Who was afraid? about this and have not taken the time to really study it. Thank you. Who was mostly being picked up there? What were the ages of the people being picked up? 
Would you kind of guess? They're young and they're students. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of them were workers. They couldn't study, but they're in the age group of young people who were hoping for a different future in Chile. And that's one of the things that some of the Allende through what was called a democratic path towards socialism. So asking the people of the country to vote. And his agenda was a very clear agenda um, to take the wealth of the country and begin to distribute it more to help the vast number of people in the country who were poor. So he was a very significant person who gave a lot of hope to a certain sector of the society, but terrified a lot of people in the country too who were clinging to the social order and um, the divisions of wealth in the country. And then internationally, the fear, quote, of communism, even though this was coming about through a democratic process. So that's just something for us to keep in mind as we tell the story uh, today, okay? And is anyone here close to 22? Yeah, okay, there's probably quite a few people that are here, the students, so I'm really glad you're here because I think you'll relate I was 22 then, going off to Chile, and um, I didn't have a lot of preparation or orientation, and you'll see how things unfold. Um, thank you so much, Kathy. Oh, go ahead. Um, so in 1975, you were 22 years old and had just graduated um, from college at Notre Dame and jumped at an opportunity to be a volunteer teacher for two years out of Mary Knoll grade school school in uh, Santiago. What influences led you to make this decision? Well, uh, there were several, but I'll start off with the first one. When I was 12 years old, I grew up in South Bend, Indiana. My parents um, both eventually worked at Notre Dame. My dad was in the administration, and my mom was uh, an office administrator in one of the faculty departments. Um, and um, when I was 12 years old, I started babysitting. And the family then invited me to babysit um, their children was a Nicaraguan family. And no one in my neighborhood spoke another language. You know, everyone was white, Midwesterners, pretty much in my neighborhood. And so I got invited over to their house, and their house was different because they had all these Mesoamerican artifacts on their bookshelf. And um, the father was an architect, and they had quite a glamorous, um, they, were, they were a poor family or struggling because um, they had seven children. And the children were ra ranged in age from two to ten. And there was a set of twins in there. And I was 12, and I was now in charge of these children. And so um, it was quite, you know, and I, pretty soon I proved myself to be an okay babysitter, and I was always on call. Uh, can you imagine, what do you think I was getting paid per hour at that time? It'd be about 1965. A dollar fifty? A dollar? Okay. Are you ready? Thirty-five cents an hour. <laughs> By the time I got out of high school, I, I got up to fifty cents. But the thing that um, that was so important to me was starting to learn about Latin America through this family. And actually, the family members um, were were from the very upper class, but the father of the family did not want to return to his country because it was under the Somoza dictatorship, and he knew that as a professional, any job he'd take, he would be under the thumb of the dictator, and he refused to do it. He refused to go home. And so that was my introdu introduction, but also I heard them speaking Spanish, and so when I went to high school, what do you think I took? Spanish. Um, and I had great teachers, and I really hope everyone who ever takes a language class really values their teachers. So that was very inform important for me. But when I went to Notre Dame, um, I was in the first group of women. That was a struggle, still is a struggle. Um, but I went to Notre Dame, and uh, I was able to then go to Madrid to study, and so my Spanish improved a little bit more, and I joined an or parts of the campus community at Notre Dame that was about social justice and social change. And where we as students went, were invited to go on immersion experiences over our fall and spring breaks and in the summer. So I took every advantage. And one of my um, possibilities that I got was to go and live for a summer in, in San Miguelito, Panama. And if any of you know about San Miguelito, Panama, 
that was the place where theology of liberation and the first Christian-based communities started to spread from um, the pastoral imagination uh, led by Father Leo Mann, who was actually here in the Chicago Archdiocese. So I got to spend a summer there, and I began to see how the connection, it was like a click, and I saw the connection between my faith and social change. And it was a very profound um, experience for me. What were your first days in Chile like, um, and who were you living and teaching with? And what did you learn about the repression uh, by the Pinochet dictatorship um, and the responses of the church after the 1973 coup? A lot, a lot of parts to answer there, and that you'll see that if you dig into the books. Um, there's a lot of different elements to, to think about. Um, I was traveling through Latin America with some other people who were going to be going, coming down to Chile, but they were all guys. And so they didn't have placements yet of what they were going to do, but I had a placement to begin teaching. So I arrived in Chile early. Um, we, we hitchhiked, bus, train, um, you know, found, found rides, whatever. And we went all through Central America. We're talking 1975, you know, before many of the wars that devastated um, Central America. And um, from Panama, I went on, on a flight to Chile. So I arrived on, and then late July, which is winter time, in Santiago. And, you know, we really didn't have much orientation. It was more like a couple of the priests kind of spoke with us and said, you know, here's what Chile is going through. Didn't ask me a lot of personal questions. I think they were checking me out. Was I mature enough to even, you know, be doing this? And it was the first year of this program, so not things had not been thought through very deeply. Anyway, because I was the only woman, of course, I had to be on the other side of the city from where the other Notre Dame students were. But that was okay with me. I was going to be living with three sisters, Sister Helen Nelson, Sister Paula Armstrong, and Sister Bernadette Ballesty. Helen, Paula, and Bernadette. They were from the School Sisters of Notre Dame, and they had been working with the Holy Cross priest in Santiago, Chile, and were running a school, like a St. Ignatius school, like from K to 12, um, and it was one of the elite schools in the country. And um, a month after the coup in 1973, the coup d'etat, where Pinochet came into power, a lot of army trucks pulled up in front of the school, and they went in, and they threw out the nuns and the priests and said, you no longer own your school. And they took the school away from the, the uh, Holy Cross community. So they were all unemployed, many families, um, by that time, many families were um, leaving the country because they were being targeted for being uh, dissidents or being of another political party, and their jobs were being eliminated in many cases. I didn't mention this, but Dan hinted at it. Um, the repression in Chile immediately after the coup was enormous. More than 27,000 people were tortured, severely tortured. 3,000 were outright executed. Another 3,000, and these are documented, they're probably more, the numbers can vary in depending on who you research it from, but these are from the Chilean National Report on Truth and Re Reconciliation. Another 3,000 were called disappeared, and I'll speak about that a little bit more, but these were people who were taken, seen to be taken by authorities, um, where they knew the clothing that their son or daughter was wearing or their husband, they saw the trucks pull up, they saw officials take them and put them in the truck, or maybe they saw them going into a certain prison, but when the families went to find out where they were and what was going on with them, they were sh pushed away and said, if you hang out here and ask more questions, we're pulling you in, and you will be arrested. So still, even though there were at least 3,000 people who were disappeared, 1,500 still are unaccounted for as of, as of today. And uh, last fall, which was the 50th anniversary of the coup, the current President Boric um, begged and, and told the United States, release the records. We want to know, and they told all the authorities, the military authorities, we want to know where are these 1,500 people? Where did you, what did you do with them? We do know that many times, um, someone was tortured 
or near death, and they took them up in a helicopter and just threw them into the Pacific Ocean to their deaths. And this was uh, typical types of, of um, retaliation that happened, as Dan mentioned, all across the southern cone of Chile, and then these I, things were repeated. Probably important to say here, too, that more than 6,000 Chilean um, officers, military officers, were at the School of the Americas in Panama in the Canal Zone training in the years before the coup. So these were all the counterinsurgency techniques that were being taught at that time and then were deployed on the civilian population. So just to add to that. Um, I will tell you, I'll do a brief little reading from my first day because I think it speaks to what, um, what was going to come. So on the day I arrived in Chile, it was um, turned out to be very frightening for me. When I got off the plane, this is back when you would walk down a stairwell to the tarmac, and then you'd walk across the tarmac, and you'd go into a, what's called the arrivals room. And there they would be checking out your passports and, and that sort of thing, stamping approval, letting you into the country, or, or refusing you entry to the country. And so that was intimidating because all around this room, there was probably a room about this size, and all over there must have been 12 military guys dressed in deep green wool um, uniforms modeled on the Third Reich of Germany. In other words, modeled on the Nazis. And that alone was enough. I felt I was in a World War II movie at that time. And every one of them had brand new shiny machine guns. And they were swinging their machine guns as they looked around the room to see who um, might be a dissident, who might be someone we got to get out of here, you know, el eliminate. I was very intimidated and alone at that point because I was the only one traveling in. But when I got outside, when they finally stamped my passport, I got outside and there was this beautiful sounds of these happy families speaking to each other in Spanish and welcoming whoever came um, in to travel. Uh, and then I looked up and there's a beautiful cordillera. The cordillera is the Andes Mountains, the beautiful Andes that is snow-capped. So I had a lot of different emotions. But when I, Sister Bernadette met me, and she seemed um, happy to meet me, and we drove into Santiago, and we sat down in the house, and she prepared some coffee and some toast, and then she shared a secret with me. Bernadette and I went into the kitchen where she poured Nescafe into heavy white cups and gave me some bread scored with a long crease, crease down the middle. She stammered a bit as she told me she had been alone for most of the past weekend since the other two sisters, Helen and Paula, were visiting their families in the United States. She said Rosita would be home after seeing off her first grade class, so Rosita was a laywoman who also lived in the house. She was Peruvian and that Isabel would be arriving from her job later that evening. Isabel was a Chilean laywoman, so there were three of us laywomen and three sisters in this house. And then Bernadette said, the others asked me not to talk about this right away, but I think you should know something. The drop in her voice and halting speech made me a little panicked. Well, sometimes we have visitors here, people who need help. They are people who need to be in a safe place if their lives are in danger. One of our visitors just left this morning. I don't think I blinked, but I tried to take it in. We called him Juan, she said. It's been very dangerous for several weeks since the story came out in the international press. Some reports claimed he had been in an embassy and had left the country, but it wasn't true. He was still here in our house. And the Dina, the secret police, knew he had not left the country. And then she told me the story of how he got arrested. So this man that they called with a pseudonym Juan, his real name was, um, his last name was Torres, and he, he um, had been picked up by the secret police and terribly, terribly brutalized. And they were looking for one of his colleagues 
who was from another political party and who worked at the Committee for Peace. The Committee for Peace was an organization of churches that were trying to work on the human rights issue, the lack of food for the children, the poverty issues, um, just trying to reanimate the public to survive, helping them to survive with unemployment projects and, and other different ways. And um, this man knew someone, they believed he knew someone who worked inside of the Committee for Peace in downtown Santiago in the Plaza de Armas. So they took him out of the jail where they were torturing him and they brought him into the middle of the Plaza de Armas in the middle of the day as everyone was leaving their buildings for lunch. And somehow he had the courage, he broke away from the secret police and he ran through the crowd shouting, the Dina, the Dina. And the Dina were the secret police. And some of the people from the Committee for Peace surrounded him and pulled him back into their offices and blocked the door and would not let the secret police come in and grab him again. Well, he was sent to um, Cardinal Silva's very personal doctor, his personal doctor, and that doctor documented his wounds. And then the doctor sent Cardinal Silva a visual report. He drew a silhouette of the man's body, front and back, and he marked every place that he had been tortured with electricity or with a whip or cigarette burns or you name it, you know, beatings. And he had over a hundred visible wounds on his body. And Cardinal Silva, and that was the man who was in the house up until the day I arrived. So the sisters were already hiding people and he was the one that they were protecting after this terrible um, assault on his body. And Cardinal Silva said about him, he showed that silhouette to all the other bishops and the bishops from that point on, he said, redoubled their efforts to work for human rights. So Sergio was a very, Sergio uh, Zamora Torres was a very important person, but one of, you know, thousands who suffered a similar fate. Well, I'm 22. This is, we just had coffee and toast. I've just arrived. I'm like, what do I do with this information? But I knew I had come to Chile and I wanted to be here for two years. And I thought, well, little by little, I'll understand what this is all about. And that's how I took it in. Yeah. Um, so on October 15th to 16th, there was a major confrontation between the secret police, the DINA, and the armed leftist militants, MIR. And how did you learn about this? Let me position myself here. So I arrived at the end of July, and so now it's October 15th to 16th. And I've been teaching in the Marinal Grade School in a very poor area, but with wonderful Marinal sisters administering the school, a lot of welcome to me. Uh, Rosita also taught there, my Peruvian friend who lived in the house. And Helen uh, Carpen, Helen uh, Nelson and uh, Paula Armstrong, who were the other two sisters living in the house, were also on the staff. They had all been on the St. George staff, the school that got intercepted by the police, so they no longer had their jobs, so they went to work in other communities in Santiago. So there were four of us from the house actually working there. And um, so that day, October 15th, I was, or 16th actually it happened, I was downtown and I was kind of feeling proud of myself. I was like, well, you know, I've been here nine or ten weeks and I've got a couple of friends, and hey, I'm walking downtown by myself right now. I know where I'm going a little bit better. Um, i feeling a little bit of confidence in myself. Like, you know, I'm not the worst teacher I was three weeks ago. So, you know, I'm just, I'm feeling like, you know that moment you think, like, maybe I'll catch on here, maybe I'll feel a part of things, and I won't be the stranger for so much longer, which of course was an illusion, but, um, but anyway, so I was feeling kind of confident, and all I was up downtown on the Alameda. The Alameda would be like Michigan Avenue, right? The lakefront Michigan Avenue. 
And all along the street, there were blankets on the floor, on the ground, and there were wares for sale, and people were sitting next to their wares, and they had a little table that they were showing their special products. They could be secondhand books, or they could be shoelaces, or whatever it was they were doing to try and make a living. And so I was kind of wandering and looking at things, and it wasn't as freezing cold, even though it was still winter, and I was feeling kind of good. And all of a sudden, does everyone here know what a newspaper vendor is? I mean, you know, we don't have a lot of newspapers anymore, but there was a kiosk, almost every corner there was a kiosk of someone trying to sell newspapers. And usually the newspapers were hanging on clotheslines on the kiosk, and you would say, I want El Mercurio, or I want El Segundo, or whatever it was, because there were lots of newspapers out there. Well, all of a sudden I'm walking by, and the vendor there, the owner of the kiosk, starts shouting, Enfrentamiento en Mayoko! Uno de la Dina, herido! Uno de la Mir, muerto! And he kept repeating this and shouting it, and people started clustering to this um, kiosk. And I stopped, and I'm like, what's Mayoko? You know, I'm trying to figure out the words, and I'm like, what is this all about? And it turns out that he was saying there had been a big shootout between the secret police who had fell upon the hideout, the secret hideout of the Mir. And Mir was the top leftist arm movement in, in Chile. And the head of Mir was Andres Pascal Allende. He was the nephew of now the now deceased, assassinated President Allende. So he was Pinochet's number one target, one because they were opposing him militarily, and number two because symbolically to decapitate him would be a great victory because it was a symbolic victory that he was taking down one of Allende's family. Well, everyone who kind of clustered up to the kiosk, but no one bought a newspaper. And I'm like, that's strange. Why, why is no one buying a newspaper? But I, I just felt like a bolt of fear going through me. I could feel the sensation of everyone around me. And soon we all just backed away, because to pick up a paper might mean that you were interested in the fate of the mere people. And so what I knew at that moment, I went home, I told everyone else in the house, they're like, Oh my God, there'll be hell to pay for this. This is the nun's cursing, saying, oh, there's going to be hell to pay for this. Oh my gosh, this is really bad news. You know, there's, the country's already tense. What else is going to happen? Um, approximately five days later, we were planning a party for Sister Helen. It was her birthday, and we had made plans over the weekend. We were out buying shopping food, getting some pisco, getting some tinto, you know, tinto, and um, items to, we were, gonna, we were going to fry hamburgers. I was so excited. First time I was going to eat hamburgers in like four months. I was so excited. And um, we had all these plans. And when I came home from school that day to help lay out the party things on the platters and the food, Sister Helen intercepts me and she says, Kathy, we have a visitor here tonight. It would be better if you don't talk too much. <laughs> me? Don't talk too much? It would be better if you don't talk too much about yourself or about household members. Um, and let's just do the party. So I go into the kitchen to start the preparations with others. And there is a young woman there in blue jeans and a turtleneck shirt and a uh, folkloric type of blouse over her turtleneck because it's still winter. And um, she tells me her name's Mariana. I tell her my name. And um, pretty soon I realize, you know, this is, I didn't realize it was related to my Yoko yet, but it, it was starting to dawn on me. So then the party people started coming in, all the inv invitees. We had about 30 people, a lot of the nuns and priests. Isabel, who worked with Comité Pro Paz, had some of her friends coming over. And suddenly, out of the side window in the dining room, I saw shadows walking through the back, back patio into the back entryway into the house. And they were taking, it looked like two other people. So when the party was over, 
I was pulled aside and I was told, Kathy, um, we have two other people here as visitors tonight. Uh, go in your room and retrieve your clothes and your items for school for the next couple of days. And I did so, and I go to my bedroom, I knock on the door, and I walk in and there's this man in his undershirt, his blue jeans, exhausted. And he has his back to me, and he has a pillowcase between his knees. And when he sees me, he shoves something that seemed to me like heavy back into his, into the suitcase, or into the pillowcase. And I didn't even want to look at him. I just went in, grabbed my clothes out of the closet right in front of him, and kind of backed my way out of the, <laughs> out of the room. I was pretty scared. And um, I never saw the front of his face, but I saw him from the back. And the rule for the mir to be sh sheltered by the church, essentially by the church, through the Comité Propas, because they were brought there by the Comité Propas, was no weapons. But what he had in that pillowcase was automatic weapons. And there were several confrontations over the next few days um, where the and I'm going to speak here to the Jesuit, the Jesuit community, uh, two Jesuit priests with the committee, um, Father Fernando Salas, um, a Chilean, and Chilean Father Patricio Carriola, were both involved in bringing the mere people there under those same conditions of no weapons. But of course, they were being test, they were testing us, and they were also betraying what they said they would do. So it was a very tense situation, but the man who was in my room, in my bedroom, was Nelson Gutierrez, number two of the Mir, and he had two bullet wounds in his leg, and they were festering, and they, he was probably going to die from the infection that had set in. He and his wife had hidden out in the fields. After the, after the shootout, they were able to flee into the fields, the farm fields. They hid out for two days, and they had a nine-month-old baby with them maybe a candy bar and breast milk for the baby. So after a couple days, they um, uh, hijacked a few cars and um, were able to get somehow get into Santiago. And they went to talk to some priests that they thought might be sympathetic and would help them, which they did. But the rule was no weapons. But nonetheless, they were brought in repeatedly. So it was a very tense few days with them there with these preoccupations about someone might die. And so we needed to have a doctor come, and a doctor named Dr. Sheila Cassidy. And some of you might remember her name. Um, she was a British citizen, and she wrote a book called Audacity to Believe back in 79. It's well worth looking at, because our lives intersect here. Um, she came, but she could not help him. She tried to pull out the bullets, but she couldn't. And she came and told the priests and the nuns in the house, listen, within a day or two, he's going to die here because of the sepsis. You have to get him an embassy right away. And in the embassy, an embassy would have the ability to bring in surgical equipment and that kind of stuff, because you don't get searched going into an embassy. Well. The priest went off, tried to find an embassy that would take this couple. Oh, I forgot to tell you, when the couple fled through the fields with the baby, a peasant woman came out and said, Compañeros, le puedo ayudar. My friends, can I help you? And Maria Elena Bachman, the mother of the, and the spouse of Nelson, but the mother of the baby, handed the baby to the campesina woman, and they went on the run. So it was just a very dangerous time. Uh, the priests went out trying to find an embassy. They struck out the first day. By the second day, they had no place else to turn. Can you imagine? Can you guess what embassy they might have gone to? You won't believe it. The Vatican embassy in Chile. So the priests went there, and they laid it on the line to the nuncio, the papal representative and said, here's what's going to happen. And we're going to have a dead man in a convent. Then what? So the, the nuncio was not happy. <laughs> and he um, said, look, bring them here during daytime to avoid more suspicion. So the next day, the 25th, 
of October. Father Gerardo Whelan, Holy Cross priest, and Father Patricio Carriola arrived at our house. And they got Nelson and his wife, and they helped them out of the house, back into the back garage of the pastor's house next door. And they opened the trunk of the car and they said, get in. And then they closed the trunk of the car and they drove all through Santiago. And they got to the street, uh, Montolin, where they had to turn. And it was a one-way street. And somehow at that same moment, a car came up the street the wrong way. And all the security guards and the Dina outlook were stationed there. They all ran into the street to push away the car. And Gerardo Whelan hit the gas and he got in to the Papal Embassy's property, and Nelson and Lena um, survived. So um, just 10 days later, on November 1st, Dr. Cassidy, a British citizen and physician, asked you to come visit um, Sister Connie Kelly, who was ill and resting at the Columbia Father's house. What happened that day? Just pull this up again here. I'm not it's a complicated story. Um, so that day, on November 1st, um, as you mentioned, that was the first day we came back to our house. Uh, the, the three of us who were lay women were staying in another at the convent near the school where we were teaching. And the Mary Knowles sisters allowed us to stay there. And when we came home to the house, um, we decided, okay, it's Saturday morning. We came back Thursday night. We're like, Saturday morning, we've got to scrub this house, wipe down all the windows, wipe down all the sills, wipe down all the counters, the best bed posts, the inside of uh, dresser drawers, et cetera, et cetera, floors, to burn the trash, all these things, because we didn't want any evidence of the Mir people being there. We were checking the house to see if there was any evidence around. So after about half a day of cleaning, the phone rang, and it was for me, which was kind of strange, and it was Dr. Sheila Cassidy, a British citizen, who uh, was a mutual friend to Sister Connie Kelly. And Sister Connie Kelly had been befriended me uh, in these first few months, and she was always taking me out to the poblaciones, to the poor communities, when she was doing home visits or checking on the um, comedores. The comedores were... Um, places where they were feeding the children every day. The, the community was getting together because people didn't have enough money or food in their own house to make a pot of soup. So the, all of the people would come together, the comité helped out with some financial resources so that they could buy some vegetables and a little nourishment for all the children. One time I went to one of the comedores infantiles, a small um, lunch programs out on the patio, it's usually outside the church, and uh, the church premises, and um, they had enough food for 87 children, but there were 127 children that day. So they just couldn't stretch the food anymore. So you can, it was a very, economically, it was a very tragic time. The whole economy of Chile had collapsed over these last two years um, in Santiago. And I, I went with Connie, but it turned out at this point of the story, um, Connie had become ill, and Dr. Cassidy was treating her. And Dr. Cassidy said, Connie, you can't stay in the población. It's not clean enough. The water is not pure enough, etc. Come and stay at the Columban Father's house, which is only a block away from where Dr. Cassidy lived. So Connie was in a guest room at the Columban Father's house a half a block away from Dr. Cassidy, who could run a couple times a day and do vital checks and that sort of thing. But today happened to be Connie's birthday, so Dr. Cassidy wanted her to have a friend visit. She asked me to come. I said, okay, you know, I thought that was a nice thing to do, but I also was a little weirded out by why did, did Dr. Cassidy know I lived in the house where she came to clandestinely treat Nelson Gutierrez? Was that a breach of safety, you know, so I had a few questions in my mind. Anyway, I went to visit Connie, and we were, I welcomed, I saw first uh, Dr. Cassidy in her house, she invited me for some tea, and we got to know each other, and she um, all of a sudden kind of began telling me her whole life story, but, you know, I wasn't really asking her questions like, 
but she started telling me about a man that she loved and she was abandoned by him. He left to marry someone else and she had tried to get into uh, a very elite program in Chile for plastic surgery and she never made it, never got the certification. They wouldn't let her in. And so she had gone through a lot of hardships in the two years that she had been in Chile. But she had one friend, Dr. Consuela Silva, who invited her to stay in her house. And eventually, Sheila was following Dr. Silva into the very poorest um, clinics in the poor neighborhoods. And there she was working with very few resources, like all the doctors were at that time. So she had a lot of hardships. And then she starts to tell me, um, I'm going to be leaving Chile soon. I'm going to become a cloister nun in England. And you know, I'm thinking, what kind of decision is this? You know, like, what is this? What is that all about? But anyway, we, she was just revealing herself so deeply, it almost felt like I was being pulled into a trance-like state. And I didn't understand what was going on. And all of a sudden, then she kind of snapped out of it, and she said, oh, we got to go. Let's go see Connie. So we go over to the Columban Father's house a block away, and I'm welcomed by the housekeeper, Enrique de Reyes. And, um, sister, and Sheila left on her errands. I visited with Connie. The housekeeper brought up a cake that she made for Connie. We sang happy birthday. We had a little food, soda. And we said, oh, Enrique, they just sit with us and talk for a while. And so she stayed, and she told us about her four children, how she had to leave them um, in Rancagua, which is about two and a half hours away from Santiago. She very seldom gets to go home to see her children. She told us about her 12 brothers and sisters. And so we passed the afternoon. Um, but now it was late, and I was getting really anxious. I had to get home. It had only been a few days since the Mir people were not in our house, and we knew that Dina was still looking for them. So I leave, say goodbye to Enriqueta. We wave to each other at the door as I got to the gate. And then I cut across the street. It was a very narrow street. It was only a one block long street. And I cut across, and all of a sudden, when I step into the roadway, a car comes shooting up, and it starts weaving back and forth and flashing its lights. I'm like, who are those drunk guys? Well, it's kind of early, like 7.30, 8 o'clock. You know, what are you doing out drunk at this time? Um, but then, as I walked down the street away from the Columban father's house, I heard a car door snap. And then I heard footsteps behind me. And I'm like, did someone just get out of that car? Are they following me? I could tell the man's, it was a man because it was a large, he had a large stride, but he never passed me. He was staying just behind me. And so I'm walking, I'm almost to the end of the street and I'm gonna turn to where I have to go and get the buses and I'm close to where Dr. Cassidy's house is across the kitty corner. And all of a sudden, right in front of me, this guy runs between two houses and the, it was dark and the street lights were out. And then the, moment, the cloud parted, and I see when the guy's running, he had a machine gun next to his body. And I'm like, what is going on here? Is that the secret police? Is that the mir? What is happening? But I kept going towards the bus. I was like, I'm not going to left, look left or right. I'm not going to look behind me. I'm just going to pretend that I don't see anything, and I'm going to get on my bus. But when I get on the bus, the guy gets on the bus behind me. And when I get off the bus at the transfer stop, he's trying to be, again, right behind me. But fortunately, I got the first seat on the bus. Well, we get to my stop, but I don't want to get off because I don't want him to know approximately where I live. But anyway, they close, the bus driver closes the door, and then I say to him, Oye, perdón, forgive me. And he opened the door and I jumped out and I ran into the middle of the street and I started running in the middle of the cars as fast as I could away from this guy. And the bus driver slapped the door close and the guy was trapped inside. So when I got home, Paula said to me, she opened the door, she looked at me, she said, what happened to you? Have you seen a ghost? And I told them everything that happened, but we didn't really know what the consequences of this were going to be.
And so um, uh, the next day, and sorry, we've got um, 10, 10 minutes left. <laughs> so, um, uh, so the next day, on the second, the Dina came to the convent looking for Helen Nelson. And what happened to you and others in the house that morning? So you're with me? Are you snoozing or are you, are you with me? Huh? You're with me? Pretty much? I know it's getting to that evening hour. Well, on the November 2nd, so November 1st was the All Saints Day, and November 2nd was All Souls Day. So that weekend, most of the people in Chile had off. It's a two-day holiday for All Saints and All Souls to allow families to go to the grave sites and to clean the graves and have a picnic there and put some flowers and that type of thing. But for North American people who were there, like this, a lot of the sisters or foreigners, um, they didn't have any loved ones buried there, right? So they kind of used the weekend to go on retreat or go to the coast or have a community meeting or that type of thing. Or go visit a friend, etc. So it was kind of a holiday weekend and on November 2nd, uh, of course we went to bed the night before very edgy. We didn't know really what was transpiring. And it was too late for us to try and go someplace else and hide, you know, someone else's house. Um, so anyway, at dawn, I wake up. My bedroom was right on the sidewalk, you know, that's the window, right on the sidewalk. And I could hear the purr of, of, um, of, of trucks right outside my window. The walls were vibrating because there were several trucks and they had their motors on. And then I heard the clanging when they were like, pitching open their back gate of their pickup trucks and the, their crews were getting out. And, you know, it's probably four in the morning at this time. And all of a sudden there's this pounding on the door and fierce pounding. And I, I get up and I'm walking down the hallway kind of in a daze and Sister Paula is getting up and we're in our pajamas. I had a blue nightgown and we were um, walking to the door and the pounding keeps going, and they said, Madres, abren la puerta. Abren la puerta. Open the door, sisters. And Paula said to me, open the door, which I did. And then six or eight guys with machine guns pushed in, and they told the four of us who were in the house, Rosita, me, Isabel, and Sister um, Paula, to go into the front bedroom and to have our carnets, our ID cards, and give them our ID cards. And they started questioning us in that room and they wanted to know where Helen Nelson was. They had an arrest warrant for her. And we kept playing along. We just said, we don't know where she went. She just, she went to the coast for the weekend to see, you know, to rest, but we don't know where. And they kept pressing, where, where, where is she? Because they wanted to take off for that, for that place. And then all of a sudden another commander arrives. You could tell like the squad leader who was first there was like the first guard and then the second guard comes in and they're really a lot more rough talk, and Sister Paula is pulled in and she's interrogated in the living room. And then they send her back and they ask for me, and they start interrogating me, where is Helen Nelson? And I'm watching this new commander, I'm just kind of studying him and I'm thinking to myself, these are the eyes of the Dina. You know, I was studying his face as he was asking me things. And strangely, he was asking me questions first in Spanish, and then sometimes he would, the next question would be in English. And he spoke perfect English. And I'm like, and he's tall and skinny, and he's light-skinned, and he has light hair. I'm thinking, who is this guy? And he talks some more in English, and I realize, He's an American. He's from the Midwest. I know that accent. I'm from the Midwest, you know. I immediately recognize the Midwest accent. And then he says, you're going with us. Go and get dressed. We're taking you. And I'm terrified. And I'm going in the bathroom and I'm changing clothes and I'm trying to stall. And I don't want them to take me. But by that time, I had already intuited overnight that something had happened to Sheila, that she had been taken. You know, kind of like, finally in my dreams I understood what was going on. I didn't know fully. But it turned out that they were interrogating Sheila at Via Grimaldi, the worst torture center. They had captured her at the Columban house that night. 
and the way they approached the Columban house, they had a firing squad in the front of the house and in the back of the house. And just as I left, maybe two minutes after I left, they opened fire and for 20 minutes were firing their machine guns against the house from the front and the back, which is ex kind of extraordinary. And they killed Enriqueta. They took Dr. Cassidy to Via Grimaldi, and actually, while being interrogated in the living room where I was living with the nuns, inside Sheila's jail, she could hear what was going on. So they, a direct connection was happening there. So they take me out, throw me in the back of the Dina car. I have three machine guns on me, pointing at me, the guy in the front, and the two in the back with me. And then they tell me to put on a, um, a blindfold, a kerchief that they throw at me. And so I'm blindfolded, and they're racing through the night. There's no other cars, you know, because we're in a curfew. I've got to mention that there's a curfew, so you can't move after 11 or 1 p.m. at night. And so they control the whole city and the, the country that way. And then they pull up, and I realize we're probably at the torture center that I have heard people talk about, this Via Grimaldi, and Sheila is probably inside. So they go inside, and somehow they get new orders. And then eventually they come out, and they, they're they asking them more questions. They ask, do you know where the Marino Sisters' house is, the center house for the Marino Sisters? And I calculated in my head, there can't be more than one sister there because I learned the night before that all the sisters were on retreat outside of the city. So I agreed to take them there thinking that if they saw me, any of the sisters saw me, they would know who was in danger, other people that I lived with, other priests possibly that the sisters knew. And I thought someone will tell and get word to others who might be in danger. So they took me there. We went into the Mary Noel sisters' house. Um, very brave, Sister Kathleen Gilfeather refused to let them come in the house. She blocked them physically at the door for probably 20, 30 minutes. But nonetheless, they pulled me back out, told me to put the blindfold back on, and I thought I was going to the torture center. But it turned out that they took me back to my house and said, get out of the car and signed this warrant saying we did not harm you. And it was the backside of Sister Helen's warrant. I ran away from them as quick as I could. I ran into the church next door. And from there, we went on the run for the next almost six weeks. Finally sought protection in the US consulate. And um, what did you come to realize about the US involvement with the Chilean dictatorship? I skipped one thing, may I go there to read it, what I was feeling in the car, and then I'll... Sure, I'll be, we, we're at five, so we gotta leave a, a couple minutes for... Um, okay. But yes, okay. yes, let's do it. Oh, then I'll go ahead. Oh, okay. So eventually we ended up in the, um, in the, we had to go, and Sister Bernadette and I, uh, the three sisters were expelled from the country uh, on TV. They brought cameras, the news channels, out to the airport. They had a crowd, and the crowd started pelting the nuns. They were expelling the nuns, Sister Helen, Sister Paula, and another Marino sister, Sister Peg Lipseal, who had aided the mayor in our house. Um, we tried to stay in the country, thinking that maybe things would pass, but they didn't. And so all of us eventually had to flee, and Sister Bernadette and I had to go into the U.S. Embassy because um, at that point, at least nine priests were imprisoned, many being tortured. Um, Sheila continued to be tortured for 59 days, and um, many people were fleeing the country for their own safety. It was um, a ferocious time. Inside the embassy, it was um, a kind of strange, because on the one hand, we had the U.S. Consul, who was very, very gentlemanly. His name was Josiah Brunel. And he was looking after us and kind of trying to set up things as best he could so that we could be okay in the embassy while we were waiting permission to leave the country, which turned out to be another three weeks. Um, the second thing, um, 
there was it was like a good cop bad cop routine because at the same time that we're being protected in the U.S. Embassy, what's going on? The U.S. government is fully funding the secret police, and I was able to get as you read the book, you'll be able to see how as American commander uh, was working full time with the Dina. Unclear whether he was also CIA, but we all suspect that. Um, and he is a very famous person. He is the man who set the car bomb on September 21st, 1976, underneath the car of Orlando Letelier, the former Chilean ambassador, and it was detonated by him in Washington, D.C. on that date, 15 blocks from the White House killing two people, Orlando Letelier and a co-worker who hitched a ride with him that day to work, and her husband who was blown out of the car but survived. So um, I was in touch with all of this collusion on a very direct level. But at the same time, the story of Chile is not, is not that. The story of Chile is really incredible bravery, unbelievable commitment through one's faith to save the life of another. Not that the nuns and priests were politically aligned with any of the people they were saving, but they knew they would be dead on arrival if the secret police ever got them. And finally, um, the story is, is solidarity, the solidarity that people, because when we went on the run, now other people were hiding me at night in strangers' houses. Um, so it was very deeply felt, you know, that other people were now sheltering me, saving me and the other sisters as we were trying to figure out how things were going to work out. So I thank you for your patience of hearing this story. Um, there was a lot of heartbreak for me to be that close to what my country was doing, to seeing it that close, that collusively. So thank you for listening to the story. Okay, we have time for just a few questions. So if anybody has a question, just raise your hand. I'll come around with the mic. I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. You spoke about bravery and about commitment, and you obviously had both, and, and we really appreciate your story. I wanted to add what might be kind of an additional chapter to it. Um, in the late 90s, uh, I was asked by Loyola to go to Chile, to Santiago, to start a new student exchange program. And so I was working with a Jesuit university there, which is called Universidad Alberto Hurtado, named after a Jesuit who was a big figure in social justice there. Um, and the woman I was working most closely with and a story very much like what you talked about. Her name was Isabel Donoso. That's my housemate. And I wondered if it was when the, the similarity of the first name. Of it. And what she talked about was coming home one night to, um, or, or being home one night with a group of other people like her. Uh, and it was a, a house connected to a parish hearing the knock on the front door like what you talked about, looking out, seeing who was out there, and unbeknownst to the officers out front, you were able to leave that rectory or whatever it was, go through the church and go out the back door, which they had not covered. They went out the back door and just kept right on going. And that's how she ended up in uh, the U.S. and got her advanced degree here and then was able to go back and start, you know, be with the beginning of University of Universidad Alberto Hurtado uh, a number of years later. That university was set up by the Jesuits because the most, the, the big Catholic university was Católica, which was a Pinochet uh, thing. So 
I never was in a country that was more politically polarized, even in 1999, than Chile. When you got a ride from a cab driver, they wanted to find out right away what you thought of Pinochet or what you thought of, uh, of the events before. Uh, and uh, it just, there were so many good people I ran into, but also the, the, the you know, Pinochet was not gone. Well, I thank you for mentioning Isabel. She's my hero, heroine, um, very much in this story. Um, she actually is still working on Alberto Hurtado, still helping with the exchange program between Loyola students and uh, Jesuit campuses all over the country where they're sending their students there. Um, she, one time, there's one story in the, in the book, um, I'm having dinner with her and she all of a sudden says, are you CIA? <laughs> We mended that after a while, but it was kind of scary at that time. I'm like, no, I'm a feminist. I'm against the Vietnam War. How could I be CIA? But, you know, my little college identities didn't hold much sway with her. But I'm so glad you met her. She's a, she is a true warrior for social justice, a true deep warrior. And I hope I portray her that well in the story. Other questions? I was just curious how the Catholic Church is doing today in Chile. At the time, Cardinal Solo really seemed like he, you know, really uh, promoted the helping the poor and you know, people were persecuted. I wonder if it still is. Uh, I don't have a full um, take on it. I think the saddest thing I have to tell you is um, the Chilean Church had to confront massive sexual abuse in recent years. And I have been told that um, for the Jesuits in formation in Chile, they have to be, they've been sent them out of the country because it is too painful for them to be trying to move into a consideration and discernment about becoming priest, Jesuit priest, in the context that they're facing right now. I was in a talk at Boston College um, School of Theology, a graduate program in theology, and um, Father, um, Verdugo was his last name, a Jesuit priest, um, sociologist, shared with us the, during the night that I was giving my talk a perspective on where the church is. And the uh, essence of it was that in the 70s, there was more than 70% of the people in Chile esteemed the Catholic Church as the highest um, institution in the country. And of course at that time, probably in the 70s, 90% of the people were Catholic. But at this point, he shared another statistic that currently um, the Catholic Church is about 30% of the people uh, consider, them, consider the church um, practices and um, trust. They don't have the trust. It's only 30% of the people trust the institution. So it's a very, it was very painful when the, um, Father Verdugo was giving the talk. He was almost weeping. He was so shaken by having to share this perspective. But I think it, you could look into it more, but that's a little glimpse of what, what I was told. So the question is, what made me stay when I could have fled a lot of different ways, probably? Um, I'm stupid, I'm stubborn, like maybe we could, we could start with those things, but it never occurred to me. I was like, I came to Chile, I wanted to be here two years, and I thought, you know, they don't know me. Well, I, I was a little scared about that when they picked me up, you know, now they know me. But um, I thought, you know, I'm a U.S. citizen, they're probably not going to, they would harm you, but, you know, I wasn't a big fish, you know, I didn't, they didn't have anything on me. And I, th I kept thinking it might blow over, but when I was taken prisoner by them, I also 
didn't realize that I was in trauma and in shock. And um, as you read the book, you'll kind of see me grappling with how you know my mind wasn't working so well in decision making. And I was it was all so fast paced, you know. And also I didn't know where else to. I literally did not know anyone else in the country except all of us who were in danger. And so, and I couldn't go up and be where um, the Notre Dame students were because several of the Holy Cross priests were in prison. And the ones I would have to talk to would say, you know, what should I do? So this, what I decided to do was to try and hang on till the end of the school year, and um, which was a few weeks away. I wasn't able to do that, but my, my friend Rosita, who I lived with, she said, oh, you get the why don't you come to Peru and spend Christmas with us? And then you can visit. There was another group of students in Chimbote, Peru. And so I was like, wow. And so I followed her to Peru. Her family welcomed me, like they're a new family to me. And I eventually went up to Chimbote where we had another group of students, but they were at that point moving to Canto Grande for a new mission. And so um, the school where they were volunteering, I got one of their jobs. And I stayed another year, and I was able to go and move, live with the family in the Poblacion. Um, and I taught in a preschool. And it was, um, it was a good year, but, Chup but Peru was also going through a lot of political turmoil. And at the end of that year, I felt I had wanted to come for two years. And, but now I realize it's my country who's destabilizing so many things and practices coming out of my country and I need to go back home and face the injustices in my own country. And I ended up next in the South Bronx for 10 years. Yes, Hello. Caballero. <laughs> um, I asked you this before because I know now that I'm not going to get the answer why did it take you so long to work? Okay, so after I left Chile, um, I would share the story with people, you know, verbally. And usually they would get kind of dazed because I just keep going because I was like in this trauma and I would repeat all the aspects of the trauma. And then suddenly I started, you know, realizing um, maybe I need to cut it short. So, but in my heart, I always wanted to tell the story of the sisters. But you know, I was young. I started working in, in New York, in the South Bronx. I was a pastoral so associate. We were all busy. We were like trying to save the world in the South Bronx and fighting all these battles um, for housing, affordable housing, and you name it. You know, just lots and lots of things. And we were building an organization called South Bronx People for Change. And we were having a good time with that through the various parishes. And it was a real effort, kind of like in Chile building a, a church that's really working for social justice, tying faith to helping the, real, the structural reality. So that was great, and then I got fired by a priest um, who was the pastor who had known me for 10 years, and um, his name was Louis Archiganti, and his brother was the head of the mob in New York. So Father Giganti was quite a character, he did a lot of great things, but I was kicked out when he became pastor. So I had to figure out something. I came to Chicago, closer to home, South Bend. And I started working here with the women's organization, and got to know a lot of the not-for-profits. And then I, during these times, I was getting a master's at Marinal when I was in the Bronx, Marinal School of Theology. I got a second master's in social work in Chicago. And I started working a more typical job at the University of Chicago Hospital Department of Psychiatry. But again, there I was dealing with clients with a lot of trauma on the south side. And um, and I also worked uh, as a volunteer with the Kohler Center here, up the block, um, which helps survivors of torture here in Chicago. Um, people who have immigrated here from other countries and are receiving those services. So um, I tried to say, have like some true line, but I was always busy. And um, finally, when COVID came, and I, I did certain steps towards preserving the story. In 2007, I went back to Chile, and I met with all the women I lived with, and I took intensive interviews with them, typed them up, transcribed them from the audio tape in Spanish or English, you know, sent them to them so they could verify it. 
And fortunately, I did that because I don't think I could have remembered the quality of, of things if I had not gotten their testimonies fresh. But still, it took me until the beginning of COVID when um, I realized my neighbors weren't even like coming over to say hi, you know? And so I'm like, I'm an extrovert. I need to get a project because this COVID thing is going to be really kind of long and I might, you know, fold um, being an extrovert. And I pulled out all my old research. One summer I was at Notre Dame and I went through El Mercurio, the, news, the major newspaper, and I read all the newspapers every day and photocopied things that were related to our story through that year of 1975. So I had some documentation. I started reading you know, there's a lot of lot of wonderful scholarship on Chile and Operación Condor, which um, this assassin Michael Townley was part of. So I was reading all these hefty 600, 400 page books about Latin America in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And um, I finally had enough stuff and I sat down and I said, 2023 is the 50th anniversary of the coup in Chile. The book has to come out by that date, and it came out last August. Justo, just in time, just in time, to commemorate the lives of the women that I lived with. That was the main, and worked with, it was, that was the main thing I wanted to share, because I thought they were so heroic. And their story was in the newspaper about four days, US, uh, New York Times, and other places, but faded, you know. And, I wanted to tell the intimate story, what I saw, how these people bravely and audaciously, I mean, putting people in the trunk of your car and driving through the city in the middle of the day, <laughs> yeah. um, just some of the things they did was just so unbelievable. Okay, we have time for one more question. I'll go fast. Um, first, thank you so much, that was really powerful. Um, I was really struck by your um, comment about feeling so conflicted about your country when you realized it was in collusion with Pinochet. Um, and I was also struck by your comment about how the family from Nicaragua that you knew in South Bend, they didn't want to go back to Nicaragua because of oppression but and found safety in the United States. So where does that leave, leave you, I guess, when you think about your country, I mean, do you think, like they've done terrible things, I can't stand saying I'm American, are, are you a patriot? I mean, how do you feel? Yes, I'm a patriot. Okay. Because I don't want to see another coup in our country. The US, the US sponsored the overthrow of Allende. President Nixon gave $10 million. He colluded to overthrow a democratically elected government that the President Allende was sworn in by the Congress. He didn't barge his way in, it wasn't revolution, it was a vote. And the Chilean people, by a fraction, I have to admit that, it was a three-way race, it was by a fraction, but the Congress of Chile, because he had the majority of the three top candidates, swore him in. But at the same moment, the elite capital um, and multinational corporations Chilean and American were pressing down, went and met with uh, with President Nixon before Allende was even inaugurated. And at that moment, in a meeting with John Mitchell, Attorney General, Helms, head of CIA, and the famous Henry Kissinger, uh, who just died at 100 years old, um, National Security Advisor, they all colluded together to overthrow um, Allende. It took the, they thought they could do it before he was even inaugurated. It took them two years to do it. They killed the top general. Um, they assassinated the top general of the country. And, um, and then the coup commenced. Uh, they went after Allende. They knew the coup was coming. Allende was not perfect. Um, the conditions were terrible in those, last, those two years running up to the um, actual coup. But the U.S. was destabilizing the country economically, politically. Our, the AFL-CIO was backing trucker strikes. You know what happens when there's a trucker strike, like the country, all the housewives go crazy because they can't get toilet paper, they can't get food, they can't purchase things. And it strikes, you know, people are mad. 
And in Chile, this long, narrow, 2,000-mile country, <laughs> you put a blockade somewhere, nothing's going through. You know, it's a, There's no other roads around. There's the ocean, and there's the mountains. So um, all these things were very effective that they did. Uh, the CIA was totally plotting all of these actions. And the AFL-CIO, which is a union, and Chile is a very powerful uh, union con country with very strong workers' rights in Chile. And they were also targeted. The, the leadership of uh, unions were targeted very much by Pinochet. But the FLCIO was playing this role uh, to destabilize Chile, working with uh, the CIA and others. So I mean, I'm like, I'm just going to be a good citizen and stand up for what I stand up for. Um, I believe there should be justice for people. I believe there should be more housing for affordable housing. I've worked on that issue a lot. So I, as I got older, I had to pick issues that I could dedicate myself to. You can't do everything. But I think Chile is a big echo right now as we go into this 2024 presidential election. Because however you see January 6th, um, the person who got the most votes almost wasn't going to be named president. <laughs> And we're coming into 2024, and we have the same echoes happening right now. And Chile, you know, you know the nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. It's like a, a nursery rhyme, and that's the story, what happened to Chile. It was functioning, it was trying to aim towards something. But the democracy cracked, and it has taken decades for Chile to bring it back. It took, of course, a huge struggle um, by the progressive people to, to bring, to push out Pinochet um, at the 17th year of his reign, and to actually begin to transition back to democracy. I consider the country very heroic for having done that. But it's still unstable, you know? Things are not great. And we should also be thinking about Chile today because there had been an enormous forest fire. And certainly more than 400 people died in the last couple nights. Um, they don't know how many people, but in Viña del Mar y Valparaíso. So keep the country in your prayers. But I think, you know, you have a choice about how you want to be a citizen and how you want to contribute. And that's what I kept trying to see, little ways that I could do that. Can I squeeze in one final? <laughs> so I was really struck by this um, quote from, from Cardinal Silva, who responded to these um, sort of Bando 89, um, these, these laws that cracking down um, on people. And he, and he you know, rejects violence, um, political violence. But then he says, distinct is the case of those inspired by the demands of the gospel message created in conscience that they should offer to whomever requires the essential aid one needs to preserve life no matter their political persuasion, it is important to remember that the source of Christian love is rooted precisely in indiscriminate mercy. Um, and you highlight that indiscriminate mercy. And I just wanted to, maybe we can close maybe thinking about like, or if you can tell us the sort of motivations when the when um, Sister Paula or Sister Helen talked about their motivations for um, yes. um, offering aid to these people. So on the, so the sisters um, responded to a call, a kind of a uh, quiet call by Cardinal Silva back at the end of 73. And at that time, the Comité Pro Paz, the human rights organization, later known as Vicaria de Solidaridad, um, because it was shut down by Pinochet and the Catholic Church reopened it under their own auspices. Um, anyway, Cardinal Silva let all the religious communities know that if any of you can help, uh, we have some needs, you know. And he was basically saying, get in touch with us if you think you can help in some way, which meant hiding people in the convents or maybe a house that they had or something, a, a retreat house. And the sisters in my house where I lived um, reached out to him and said we would do it, along with Isabel, who was just mentioned here, was part of that decision making of Rosita. And in that little short time from 73, beginning of 74, exactly, through another year and a half when I was there in 75, they sheltered more than 20, 
uh, more than 14 different cases. Sometimes it was a mom and a baby, sometimes it was husband, wife, and a kid, sometimes it was someone there for six weeks, other times it was people there a couple of months or shorter. So it was, there were different cases, but can you imagine? You're a teacher, you're in a school, you're still running your household, you're, you're in Bible doing your prayer groups and everything, but they were sacrificing their world, you know, their safe world, to actually hide people all the time who were, who were being threatened. And there were a lot of other people in Chile who were doing the same thing, and as I said, we ended up being aided by similar people. Um, I think Cardinal Silva is a person who's renowned in Chilean history, and that quote, when I read the words indiscriminate mercy, I almost collapsed reading it when I saw his quote in, in his memoirs. It was so profound to me. And the sisters, um, on the night that they had to make the decision whether they would take the mayor people in, Isabel, Isabel warned them. Um, she knew the politics of mayor inside out, and she said they're not going to respect what you tell them. You're going to have to watch and stop them. And over three times they brought in weapons, and the nuns had to confront them and force them to give up the weapons. And the weapons were given to the Chilean Jesuits, who then took them in their vehicles and threw them out into the faraway woods, um, broken down, the weapons were broken down and thrown in the woods. They had incredible courage, and they were trying to save the life of this mother, and actually the little baby was reunited with them um, in Cuba. And you know how the baby was, the little, well she was nine months old when, when she was given to the campesina, and then they brought her to a, a house in Santiago, actually a, a Jesuit priest's sister's house, his own blood sister, and he had, she had three little boys, and he asked his sister, will you care for this baby? And the secret police were looking for the baby. They wanted the baby as a pawn. And um, he, did, you know, his sister received the baby, and he, he was putting his own nephews at risk by asking that. So some of these things are just so profound to me, this deep belief that we have to save lives. And then this baby, the way the baby left the country was, you know how some of the older habits of sisters are kind of big and blousy and long, and, and this nun apparently carried the baby out of the country under, underneath everything. And Cardinal Silva writes, he's like, I never got the full explanation, but that's what they told me. <laughs> you know? So um, people are ingenious and daring, and um, and they believed there was a bigger calling that they were called to, and it was a Christian calling of being the Good Samaritan. And you don't have to ask a lot of questions right then; you just have to save the life or heal the wound. So thank you all. Thank you so much for the invitation.